Amen. All right. So, um, 1 Corinthians, as we continue to study right through the Bible, uh, last week, um, guest speaker, you know, last time I was here was Romans 16. Uh, let's pick it up right here. 1 Corinthians 1 says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, it, it may pass off for you coming to the scriptures regularly or often, or maybe it's been a while since you've been in 1 Corinthians, or maybe you studied the Apostle Paul in the writing of his letters and epistles, and you might recognize the similarities of what he teaches. But uh, many times when I'll, when I'll go through 1 Corinthians, I'll take a little bit of an angle of how to be more like the Apostle Paul because he boldly declares, follow my example as I follow Christ. Well, we're going to look at this from a different angle. We're going to look at this from the idea of Paul writing unto the church of Corinth. We're going to be the Corinthians, well, so to speak. And I think we have uh, literary license here to do so uh, because as he writes, you'll recognize he's writing unto the church of God. Well, how did this all happen in the beginning anyway? How did, what, what is the difference? Well, uh, I was in the land this, this last uh, couple weeks, and I'm not talking about New York or D.C. I'm not talking about in our country. I'm talking about being in Israel again, and once again seeing the great conflict or the conflict of the great three religions. Some people want to pretend that uh, we can be, um, that there's only one God over all three of the religions of the same God of the Muslims, same God of the Jews, and same God as, of the Christians, and they try to proclaim that let's just all get along. That message is uh, some uh, when you're over there. And, uh, but, the, but the realities are there are only two types of people in this world. There are those who are saved and those who are perishing. And that's the realities of the witness and testimony of all of the, the scriptures, uh, all of the Tanakh, everything given of the writing of the law, uh, the Torah, that's the T of the Tanakh, and then you have the writings of the prophets, the prophetic writings, and you have the books of poetry. That's the Old Testament as we look at it, the, the writings of the, of the Jews in considering of their, of their scriptures. And something happened with the Apostle Paul, right? The Apostle Paul being Jewish, uh, something happened unto him, and, and we know what took place in the book of Acts, if you've read through this, uh, is he was saved. Formerly he was perishing, and he met Jesus Christ on the road, and he was saved by Jesus Christ. Uh, why do I labor this point? Well, I was approached on the Temple Mount by a Muslim evangelist. It's happened for me as I've been out street witnessing here in this, in this city. Um, Justin, would you push the lower left button on that device right beneath the clock and turn that off, please? Excellent, man. You, you're hired. <laughs> what happened for me, as well as it has happened in this country, is I was up on the Temple Mount, and we were, we were up there uh, again uh, touring through uh, Israel, and a Muslim evangelist came over and, and wanted to hand me a book, which I've actually been handed in this city here in Fargo. It says what, uh, what it is to be a Muslim. And he was talking about the further revelation of God given unto Muhammad, and uh, that, that I, as a Christian, you know, we, we all serve one God anyway, and that, that I needed to have this further revelation of God. And uh, through a, a course of talking with him, sharing a, a bit of exchange, and I had about five minutes with him, so I didn't have a lot of time. But I, I even had to get to this whole point is, yeah, we don't serve the same God. It's not the same God. And as much as people would love for you to believe today that there are, are five major religions or three major religions, there are only two types of people. There are those who are saved and those who are perishing. And that testimony and witness that I was able to give him on the Temple Mount, right at my, my last part parting words to him was, Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And it was that uh, he is the Messiah. He is the one promised in the scriptures. And, uh, you know, I was telling him, Allah, in your writings in the Quran, Allah has no son. Yeah, we're not worshiping and serving the same God. And that's what I got to share with him. Now, I, I know he's not going to listen to me. I wasn't listening to him, by the way, either. <laughs> 
But I know that. I know that as we get into that. But it might be today that, that you need to listen to the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians. As we look at this, when, it, when this all began in the beginning, unto the church of God. Now, church of God at Corinth, but it's all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours, in every place, we qualify. Time and place only remove us from this message, but the words written by the Apostle Paul, it's written for the church of God. How to begin in the beginning? Well, the church of God is referenced first in the Bible, in Matthew 16, by our Lord Jesus, who talks about the words of which Peter just declared that you are Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, and upon that rock I will build my church. <coughs> I'm out of practice. I haven't done this for a few weeks. <laughs> when he says about church, and, and you take a look at this. This is all about, when we're studying through 1 Corinthians, it's all about you and I being the church. Not attending the church. You know, so much has, has maybe changed, and yet maybe things haven't changed across time. The things we're going to look at in the book of 1 Corinthians are still the issues of the church today. Now, what is the church? Well, if you break down the word, the church literally means to be called out of the world. And when you look how it's used, this word church is of those, it's the assembly of those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, those who are saved by Christ Jesus, brought out of the world and brought into the assembly or the gathering together of the believers. And don't let anybody lie to you. The church, right away in the beginning, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is given on the day of Pentecost at the preaching of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, that day the Holy Spirit saved 3,000 people. Again, through Jesus Christ, and the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. Recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. Now, what? how did it begin in Corinth? Well, in Corinth, we have to fast forward a few years, and uh, the Apostle Paul getting saved in Acts chapter 9 and being called and sent out, spending time alone with the Lord in Arabia, spending 10 years back in his hometown and then in Acts chapter 10 and into 11 the Holy Spirit saves Gentiles and as you you recognize now it wasn't just the Jews who were saved but it was the Gentiles who were also saved in the giving of the Holy Spirit after that believers then traveled off to this place called Antioch and then the grace of God was given in this city called Antioch and Gentiles began getting saved there and then they needed to be taught the Word of God that's when Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the, uh, the original uh, Barney, right, the, if you will, uh, that's, it's literally his character. He is renamed because he brought people into fellowship and encouraged them in the Lord. He went and got the Apostle Paul. And he came there and they began to teach the Gentiles about Jesus Christ. And the church was birthed, right, to, well, there. And then the Holy Spirit says, set apart, set apart Paul and Barnabas, right, Paul who was formerly known as Saul, set them apart for the work which I have called them to do. And they went out and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. They get to Corinth by the time you get to Acts chapter 18. Now, it may seem to you that this all happened in a weekend, because I can talk about it here in just a matter of minutes, but this all took place over years. It was 15 years between Pentecost and Gentiles being saved. We know it was at least another 13 years, approximately, right, and therefore where the Apostle Paul then arrives at Antioch and then is sent out, and it's not until his third, uh, second journey that he gets to Corinth, in which then he preaches the gospel at Corinth, and it's recorded for us. Sosthenes is a former chief ruler of the synagogue. He's Jewish. He's, he's one of the chief rulers there, and he he got saved. Now, I'm laboring this point so you'll understand. This is written unto the church of God. This is written unto the saved. Now, why, why I belabor that point is because I attended from the time I was two weeks of age until I was 18. I attended church. I attended a place called church. Well, let's say 17. And I was never saved, but I went Sunday after Sunday to this place called church. Now, it might be today that there's more Babylonianism in the church than we ever really want to admit. That we've changed and transformed that which God gave in the beginning, that under the church of God, it was those saved out of the world, called into assembly to gather together to be one body and to worship and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2 is a great place to begin. It happened in Corinth as well. People got saved by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Now, my testimony is such that I attended church for all those years. My, my fear for, for this, this situation we find ourselves in, not Calvary Chapel Fargo, but the, the situation in which we find the church in the country in which we live, most of us approached that the church can pick and choose where they want to attend church instead of just being the church. So it's important that you and I would understand today it is to be this church of God, that church which was at Corinth, they were what? Sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, great word, right? Sanctified literally means being made holy. Well, actually, in the way the verb is written in the Greek, it literally means this, that this is a done deal and that Jesus has done it for you. So it's, it's in the passive form so that the church is saved by Christ, sanctified, the church is made holy by faith in Christ Jesus. And you look at that and you, you, you take that in, that's the church. Saved by Jesus Christ, meaning you're sanctified in an instant. The old man has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is the church of God. My whole thing of looking at 1 Corinthians, not just today, but as we study this, is that we would understand what it is to be the church of God. Not attend church here. I have no interest in you coming to me and saying, well, you know, I, I just, I, like shopping, like I like a consumer. Well, I don't really like that, that restaurant. I don't like that, that food there, the selection. I don't, you know, the clothes over there, I just don't like that style. And you, that's how church is presented today. And you need to understand this. It's infected, it's infected our, our understanding of what is desirable in church today. Now, they had their issues, and if the Corinthians didn't have their issues, we wouldn't have the book of First and Second Corinthians. Thank God they had their issues because now we can learn from their things and they're helpful for us that we too could be the church of God, called to be saints. Literally, these words, and you look them up, you're called out of the world, you're called to be holy. I would say that, that much of the church today in this North American uh, view and model of I'm going to present a brand of church to you or I'm going to, I'm going to put a menu before you in ministries or I'm going, to, I'm going to put something before you that you would desire to partake of this part of the ministry and you can sample. We have the sampler plate over here. You know, when I go to, the, when I go to a, a store, I usually will ask the stuff that they're trying to sell to me. Are these the free samples up here? <laughs> you know, church is not about free sampling. Church is not about getting all the desires the church today, right, again, that we would be the church, we're to be consumed with this idea of being holy unto the Lord, not happiness. Not happiness. See, well, am I happy in church? I couldn't be happier, right? But I'm not pursuing the happiness. I'm pursuing holiness. And as we, the church of God, pursue holiness together, guess what will, happy, what will happen with our condition is we will be primarily happy. Not always, because there's sufferings and other things that will happen. But under this church of God, grace and peace unto you from where? God our Father. Jesus Christ did not come to this world to reveal God as Father. <clears throat> Jesus Christ did not come into this world to reveal God as Father. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners from death. And unto those who are saved, he reveals God as Father. See, there's two types of people, right? So when I'm talking to that Muslim evangelist, both here in Fargo and there, it's like, very clear, they're not saved. This, this, isn't, this isn't like I have to like try to figure this out. They don't know God as Father. I know God as Father, and I know God as Father because Jesus Christ, His Son, died on the cross for me, and by faith in, in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the Son has been put within. Another union break here. <coughs> Does anybody have a cough drop? Because I certainly would receive one today. Thank you. All right, so what happened? There's only two types of people in this world, saved and perishing. What happened in Corinth? Two types of people, saved and perishing. How bad was Corinth? Pretty bad. They were into sin. They were into all manner of sin, all manner of sexual sin, all manner of false worship, all manner of idolatry. They looked pretty American before the gospel got there. Now, you and I need to grasp this and we need to catch this, that, that when he says, I thank my God on your behalf for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, verse four is all about the saving grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Nothing has changed in order to be saved, saved by grace through faith. That in all these things, you're enriched in him, all spiritual utterance, all spiritual knowledge, all spiritual riches. Now, I use the word spiritual there, so we, it just saves us from a lot of bad doctrine. 
It isn't about being wealthy to come into the church. It isn't about all of a sudden getting this great knowledge and being able to speak. This is spiritual knowledge. It's gnosis. It's the experiential knowledge of what it is to know God. This utterance is logos. It's just as Jesus Christ was the living word of God. Let's face it. Jesus shows up and the law was already 2,000 years plus years old. And he comes and gives meaning to what God had said in the past. And he himself comes and gives utterance to what God really is like. And when he, and he says those things, and now we, the church, some 2,000 years after, find an expression in the word of God that we too are to have that voice or that utterance or that logos. The actual sp uh, speaking of the word of God. We're to experience this. That's what happened in Corinth. Now, the Corinthians were Corinthian, and that did carry a connotation. If they wanted to depict somebody on the stage who was drunken, who was, who was um, into all sort of sexual immorality, they would describe him on the stage. More often than not, he would be a Corinthian because that was their reputation. Now, we might miss this if we didn't study our scriptures and know that you would think that maybe that church would become, would be second class Christian citizens. Now, I've heard that term misused to describe someone who doesn't want to walk in holiness, someone who doesn't want to be called to a saint, to want to give that excuse, well, everybody else in the body is just treating me like a second-class citizen. Listen, we're, we're not called unto happiness. We're called unto holiness. And what happened for this church needs to happen for us. That you, become, you come behind in no gift. Verse 7. Not in second place. They weren't too late to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They weren't too late to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we the church, right, we're not to come behind. We're not to fall short. We too are to experience two things, like this church. No matter how carnal they were before they were saved, they were called to be holy and to walk spiritual. God had given all these things unto them, and God expects the same of his church in all time and all places that we too would be holy. Set apart to do the Lord's will. You come behind in no gift, and then they, they, had, they had a common ingredient, and the words there in the second part of seven, waiting for the coming of our Lord. Listen, if you're in a church, and on their menu is all manner of sampler plates of ministries, and all manner of doctrines, all manner of music, and everything you like and everything you want in a church and it's the I church not you know you got we have the iPhone we have the I life we have all these things and yes believe it or not many have sought to do I church church just the way you want it listen if you miss this and, and the church that you would be attending the I church does not include this the common ingredient was the gifts of the spirit and they all expected the Lord to return at any moment the imminent return of Christ has never changed. He taught it. Jesus taught he would come back at any moment. The disciples believed it. The apostles taught it, carried it out. Paul believed it. And the, and the Corinthians believed it. Listen, the church, we the church, were to believe in the coming of our Lord. Literally there, if you look at that waiting, it's, it's, it's an, an anticipation of eagerly waiting for the Lord. Who shall confirm you unto the end? Now, the word confirm just literally means that, to make firm. We talk about confirmation, and I, maybe this is where it snuck into a good part of the, the church that was unsaved. You do realize that a man must be born again. I, again, now I'm referencing the church I grew up in. Baptized at two weeks of age, confirmed. What, what was made firm? Well, what was made firm for me was that the system I was in was teaching that I was saved by baptism. Now, the church is not to be saved by baptism, and I, Paul will, will cover this with the church at Corinth. The idea here of being confirmed, Jesus Christ is able to make firm what he began in you. And that we, the church, are to actually have that assurance of being confirmed unto the end that we may be blameless. Now, that's where I just lost everybody in the room. I know you. Right? I, I, I get involved in your lives. I know you're not blameless, as we would term blameless. But get, get this. What that literally means is that on the, in the end, when you stand before God, and to be that blameless, that word blameless means this, that you can stand, be God, stand before God, you can stand before your Creator, and with confidence you can stand there, and without question, you're saved by Jesus Christ. With that assurance, I gave witness to that Muslim up on the Temple Mount. And that was the assurance and testimony that I gave. Because look back at verse 6. 
even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. What is the testimony of Christ? Well, we started out that way today with an introduction. The testimony of Christ is in the Old Testament, the suffering Messiah, Isaiah 53. The testimony of Christ all the way through the scriptures, the promise of the Savior from Genesis 3. Uh, we, see, we see Jesus, the Son of God, right? Abraham offering up his only son as a sacrifice, but stopped right at the last minute, Genesis 22. We see the prophetic word fulfilled in this testimony of Christ is to be saved is to what? Give testimony that Jesus is the Son of God, he's died on the cross for the sin of the world, and that he has risen from the dead, and I believe and trust in him. So even this church that were formerly, okay, we'll get to this, they were formerly homosexuals, they were formerly blasphemers, idolaters, they were formerly all manner of vile uh, people living in Corinth, and they were saved. This is why the gospel of Jesus Christ can be preached with confidence that people will be saved through the hearing of the gospel. So Christ will confirm you unto the end that you may be without question in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you like that, without question? Just without question. I am not standing here on my own merits, but I'm standing upon the blood of Jesus Christ. God is faithful, verse 9. God is faithful. Now that, that gives scriptural echo to Philippians 1.6. That gives scriptural echo to God is faithful he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able 1 Corinthians 10 God is faithful to do what? God is faithful by whom you were called unto the koinonia of his son Jesus Christ our Lord so the same fellowship that Jesus had with God the Father is yours and ours because now I really have to talk to you about this why I'm out of the King James today is because the King James gives immediate understanding as you read it what's singular and what's plural. There is nothing singular about 1 Corinthians. This isn't about, I, I, I don't want to go to church there anymore, I didn't like what they said, and, I, and none of that. This is, we have been called out of the world, saved by Jesus Christ, and we've been brought together into this thing <coughs> called church. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship oneness unto the um, fully partaking of the, the life of the Son of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you. Whew. Why is this so hard today? <clears throat> I beseech you, verse 10. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, so beseeching is an admonition, is a warning. This church, 10 verses in, starts getting it. Okay, I think we can handle that because we, we get this. But I want you to understand, they're not second-class Christians over in Corinth. They're fully saved in Corinth. They're not partially saved. They're not saved and then you need to do this. They're not works-based. They're not, they're not, okay, you, you baptize and then confirm and then someday we hope it's going to work. No. They have corrections to make. You know, in a soft age filled with self-love, has come into the church. Can you believe it that, that there would actually be corrections that would come from other believers in a body of believers? We should say yes. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. This church is corrected. They're warned. They're admonished right from the get-go. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? If you're saved, you're in the named of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not, you can be right now. You can call out to God, to Jesus Christ, to save you at any moment. I beseech you that you what? That ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Same, same, same. See, a lot of pressure has been put upon this self-loving church world. Again, the Babylonianism of have it, you know, was it, was it Burger King's to have it your way? Or you could order the Whopper any way you wanted to and all these things. And, and the different slogans and the different colleges that have always appealed to the flesh. And now churches appeal to the flesh. Have church your way. We need to get this. That it's nothing about that, but it's everything about... How do we do this? We all speak the same thing, the same judgment, the same mind. How was that even possible? Well, first of all, there's no I in this. It's all, it's all the body of Christ. And what is the same thing we're going to be talking about? Well, if we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, we're glorifying him, testifying of him, always the emphasis upon Christ Jesus and being perfectly joined together with this body of believers. With this, um, the next word says, it declared unto me, unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe. So he names them out. I, I got this letter from the household of Chloe. They've ratted you out. 
They've told me what's going on there. And the Apostle Paul needed to go on there and say that there are contentions among you. That word contentions literally means a tear. This is great for you, you, you athletes out there. You understand what it is. Uh, the ligaments are those parts of the body that hold the joints together. It's the, the tendons and the ligaments of the tissue between the muscles, muscle to muscle, or muscle to bone, or, or bone to bone. I think it's ligament, bone to bone, if I got that right. So this word here, contention, actually talks about a tear. It's rent. It's broken. It's, it's ripped. It's a, it's, a, it's a torn ligament in the knee. You can't run very well with a bad knee. So when you get this, what's happening, it says spiritually, right? Instead of being perfectly joined together, and again, perfectly joined is the antithesis of that. Perfectly joined means that, that the ligaments and things are working in that body of believers. That church over there, Calvary Chapel Fargo, they're not, they're not contentious. They're not full of strife. They're not torn over there. That group over there, they're one, of one mind, one judgment. They're speaking forth the same things about God about Jesus Christ. So he beseeches the church at Corinth to live that way because he heard a report that they weren't. Contentions, strife. Now you study this, this might be for your household, this might be for the church, but certainly for us to be the church of God, the church is not to be filled with strife. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas. Now Cephas is the Apostle Peter, oh, and I, I of Christ. Think about the various things that people would say, well, I follow this teacher, or I follow this. Hey, we're experiencing this right within Calvary Chapel after Pastor Chuck Smith went to go home and be with the Lord. It was happening before that was going on. I listen to this guy, I listen to this guy, I follow what this guy teaches. Listen. And then some will say, no, I don't follow any man, I follow Jesus Christ. It's not like the person who's saying, I follow Christ, is all of a sudden, like, they're the noble ones here. There's no division in Christ. There's nothing separated. So when they, they're standing up saying, I follow this guy, and I follow that guy, and another one says, no, I follow Jesus only. Now, I've been the guy who's probably said all those at some point. But I want you to get this. As the church of God, what, what we learn from the church at Corinth is we're to be perfectly joined together and we're not to experience these contentions. Is Christ divided? Verse 13. Was Paul crucified for you? All rhetorical there, no. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Can you imagine that someone was saying that? I was baptized by the Apostle Paul. And some people do this. They would have actually elevated, well, let me, your baptism, well, my baptism was in the Jordan River on this recent trip. You know, I don't know, where was your baptism? Was your baptism in a bathtub? And I mean, it isn't about that. It's about being baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, you, you get how quickly we could bring forth a strife or a contention. Is Christ divided? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And look what Paul says in 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Now, Sosthenes was one of the chief rulers of the synagogue, and Crispus replaced him. So two chief rulers of the synagogue are saved at Corinth while the Apostle Paul preaches the gospel there. And just a great, great testimony of these names. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. Now, there was a man sent to baptize, right? Before Jesus, there was a man to go out into the wilderness and cry out, repent, and he turned a whole nation ready to receive their Messiah. He turned a whole people. John the baptizer cried out in the wilderness, and he was sent specifically to preach repentance and to give a baptism of the remission of sin. Well, Paul wasn't sent to baptize. He said, and I baptize, uh, lest any of you should say I baptize in my own name, and I also baptize the household of Stephanus, besides I know, know not whether I baptize any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Has the church been sent to baptize? Is that the primary, is that the call? No, he says, go therefore and make disciples baptizing them into the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And you have that in right there. What else would it be about doing? We're to go therefore and preach in Jesus Christ's name. Again, Luke 24, we're to preach repentance and remission of sin. Now, if you show up and the church is preaching baptism confirmation, or if the church is preaching the Holy Spirit, or the church is preaching, you need to do this. So that if they're preaching anything other than Christ, then they're off track. If they're preaching that baptism is the way. Paul says, I didn't, I didn't preach baptism. I wasn't called to that. 
Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now this wisdom of words literally is the understanding to have an expert presentation. Like only someone is qualified to expertly present some information about this. Listen, we live in a day and age where we knowledge is plentiful and abounding. Knowledge doubles and all this knowledge can be in your pocket or, or in your purse. You pull out that, that smartphone that contains all this wisdom of, of words. The expertise of man is in one place. Are more people getting saved now because we have the expertise? No. Paul says it's not about the wisdom of words. He says, lest the cross of Christ should be made empty or vanity. He says, this isn't about wisdom of words. He preached the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to die for sin. And you and I need to turn, turn back to this one thing. He says, for the preaching of cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So verse 18 is where I get that there's two people in this world. Those that are saved, those that are perishing. The message of the cross, well, what is the message of the cross? Is the message of the cross, you know, just obey the Spirit, whatever he tells you to do? Is that the message of the cross? No, I've heard that. I, I don't think that's the message of the cross. Is the message of the cross, God wants you to be happy? I don't think that's the message. Is the message of the cross that, that you should have your best life now? Is that the message of the cross? And you wouldn't believe what people say from pulpits and then they totally miss this message of the cross. Jesus came to die on the cross. He died to sin. Paul said to the church at Rome, he says, you too reckon yourselves indeed dead to sin. This church, like every other church, the church, you and I as church, we're to walk in this power of the cross. Lest the cross of Christ should be made empty? I don't think so. Preaching of the cross to them that are perishing, it's foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Power over sin. You do realize that. As a Christian, you are to have power over sin. As you repent from sin and receive Jesus Christ, you're now to experience power over the former sin. Power over all those things that bound you. The power of the cross was, I could not rescue myself, and I was saved by this, the power of the cross of Jesus Christ when I believed in him. This is what the church is to be about. This is the church of God, which, which God holds very, very uh, much in his hand. If you understand that, that none can take you out of the Father's hand, Jesus taught, and he says none could take you out of his hand. It's as if the Father and the Son hold the church in their hand. And when you get this, that, that security that's to be in place there, that we, the church, are to be all about preaching the cross of Jesus Christ. This world is crazy. The church is even crazier when it comes to what's presented or what's taught or what's, or what's what. The preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. You can use it as a lead-in. Is the message of the cross foolishness to you? Why, yes it is. Well, then you're perishing. What do you mean? See, where will the church stand up and say, like I'm saying right now, if you have not been born again, you haven't been born from above, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are perishing. What's that word perishing mean? It means that you will be eternally separated and tormented in hell. That's the message of the cross. The good news has the backdrop of the bad news. How do we communicate these things to a lost and dying world? Well, start with this. Let's stop lying to people. Let's stop lying to, let's stop misrepresenting the grace of God that says God, God, is, God is gracious to everyone and it's okay no matter what you do. When there's two types of people is that the message of the cross is if you are not saved by Jesus Christ and you spend eternity in hell. And that's what Paul went out with. See, because if it wasn't about that, why would people want to kill him? Because he told people that they're going to go to hell unless they receive Christ. They wanted to kill him in Corinth. They, they tried it there, and, and they had no opportunity to do that. For it is written, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now here's where we turn aside to something specific for us here at Calvary Chapel. And I invite you to turn over with me to Isaiah 29. It is written. Now the word of God had been given through Moses, recorded. Some of it was in stone, right? The word of God, the commandments written down in stone. I, see, I saw some stuff in Washington, D.C. this last week written in stone. 
Now, hopefully I'll be able to tell if they come and actually like <laughs> want to change the message that, hey, that's, that, one's, uh, that one's been tampered with. See, that which was written down in stone by God, the Ten Commandments, unchanged. That which was recorded by Moses from God, given to him, he wrote it down that it would not change. So the people just listened to the Word of God, right? They had it? I mean, church, the church has the Word of God. We just listen to the Word of God and everything's good? Well, the church at Corinth proves that the church does not listen to the Word of God, and that's why the, the letter was written back to them. I thought it was enough just to hear one time, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord of God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. We don't need any more Bible studies. Well, we need Bible studies because the Spirit of God. What happened in, in uh, Isaiah 29? Where this is quoted from, what happened was God sent a prophet to a nation who had the Word of God, and they wouldn't listen to what was written down, so he sends them a prophet. So certainly they're going to listen to the prophets, right? <laughs> certainly the, the people of God are going to listen to the prophetic Word of God. Not so much. Not so much. Well, look at Isaiah 29. Let's pick it up in uh, 9. Isaiah 29, 9 says, Pause and wonder, blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. You've all seen drunk people. The, Cor the Corinthians were known for their drunkenness, but he's now talking about something else. They're staggering and drunk, not because of wine, but because of something else. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, Read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, Read this, please. And he says, I am not literate. I am sick and tired of hearing the message that, that the people of God couldn't possibly understand the word of God. I, I, I kid you not that many in church, they won't even teach the Bible because they don't believe that, that, that the likes of you sitting in the pew can grasp and understand or even have an appetite for the Word of God. I was told by a man in this town, uh, a co-worker of mine, who said that when I, when I just shared with him about church and was talking with him about Christ, and he says, people can only endure 15 minutes of a sermon. I said, wow, that's not my experience at all. I, I really actually believe that you can set yourself aside to hear the word of God and we are experiencing in this land the same deep sleep upon much of what's called churchianity. Now, why do I say this to you about you and I? We have a decision to make as church. Now, we're not attending church here. Although this is, this is your body of believers, right? This is us. We are the church. So this isn't just a place you show up. This is a place where we are in the body of Christ together. Whole different approach to this. Now look at 29, uh, I think I left off in 13. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by commandment of men. And that's the specific word I have for us today. Over and over, this verse has come up, ministering to individuals who've attended here. All right, you see the difference? We have a choice and decision to make today. Can you hear me? We, as the church of God, the local expression here, are not to have ears, right, that cannot hear God's word, but we are to not just draw near to God with lip service. Don't lie to God in worship. Don't, don't lie to God in, in the assembly of the believers. But when we get, get this, Isaiah was sent to a people who would not listen to the word of God. We today need to be the church of God that does what? Listens to the word of God. Now verse 14 is actually where it's quoted from, why we make this jump from 1 Corinthians to Isaiah 29. Therefore, behold, I will, do, uh, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. And then it talks about those who seek to live their lives separate from the counsel of God. Calvary Chapel Fargo, right? This local expression, us, we, can you hear that this today is a we, it's a plural. Will we honor the Lord not just with lip service, but will we honor him with our hearts? So that the heart is not separated from the lips and saying, you know what, we are here, we come to church to meet with God and to hear from God and to do what he says. This church at Corinth, the backdrop for what happened with them, what Paul wrote to them, is helpful for you and I. I'm preparing you for this study. And you, likewise, will you prepare yourself week in, week out to read ahead. 
to, to take in the word of God, to consider what's written, to say, the decision before you today is this. Do I approach God only with lip service? Is my heart actually far from God when I come to church? Is my heart a million miles away from the Bible study? Is my heart a million miles away, yet my lips are singing forth the same praise songs every week? How does this work? I grew up in that particular denomination who preached baptism as salvation and taught confirmation of baptism. But it wasn't until I was saved that I realized, looking back, that I was only giving God lip service. I prayed the Lord's Prayer at least once a week because it was part of the, the order of service. And I realized after years, in fact, it took years to restore its meaning to me that I never once prayed it, but it was always empty lip service. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? 1 Corinthians one twenty. Where does this leave us? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? All the experts of this world, all the experts in how to grow church, all the, all the marketing methods, all the tactics, all the seeker-sensitive models, all the emergent church, all the liberalism, all the things you can't tell people their sin. Everywhere. We don't mention sin from the pulpit. Listen, all those things that have been told to you, all the things that said you can't teach the people just the Bible, your service has got to be more than just the Bible. Everything that's ever been said. And I want you to get this. Where is the wise of this age? Where's the dispute? Or where are they? Well, when it comes down to this message, let's not miss this. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Paul just got back from Athens, Acts 17, when he shows up in Corinth, Acts 18. Now he talks to the Corinthians with the backdrop of having been in the, the, the headquarters. Athens was the place where people just sought about to, to say new things. All the philosophies of man, all the wisdom of man was happening in Athens. He shows up in Corinth. Listen, the backdrop of this world is always looking for the expert. We're called out of this world. We're brought into this. We're to be fools for Christ. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now we're going to actually leave the study right there. We're going to pick up next week right there and we're going to go right all the way through chapter 2. But I've done something unto you today, and I've done it purposely. The scriptures teach that we are to be the church of God. That's the place of decision of, I don't attend church. Where do you attend church? Where do you, when people say that to you, say, I don't attend church, I, I am part of the church. When people ask you, well, what's your church like? It's, it's like, it's like, like the Bible reveals. I mean, what, what do you say to people? So purposely, I've done this unto you today that you would really consider, are you the church of God? Are we the church of God? And if we consider that now, what we're called unto and called to be saints and what Christ has done for us and the riches and everything of the gifts and everything of the corrections that will need to come and everything that I brought by way of Isaiah 29, are we a church that offers only lip service to God. Are you, as a part of that, are you speaking your mind in church or are we all speaking the mind of Christ? Are we speaking that my judgment, I don't like this, I don't like that, this person, that, or are we speaking the judgment of Christ? Are we speaking the one body? And when I say this to you this way, is it today that your hearts are near the Lord or far from Him? My prayer where we leave this today is, is I would love to see God by his spirit, work in our hearts in this one issue alone that he would have our hearts individually and it could be described then collectively that there's one mind and one heart in this body of believers. And that's what I present before you today. If you want to be a part of that, you just, in your heart, you just tell the Lord, yes, you have my heart. I know what it's like to give lip service to God. I did it for 20 years before I was saved. Well, 17 years before I was saved. It's possible for those who are saved, like, like the hardness of heart that happened in the days of Isaiah, their hearts became hard to what God said. Now, being over in Israel again, my heart is once again renewed and revived that all these things in the Bible are exactly as they're written down. My encouragement for you today is will you open up your heart? It's a question. Will you open your heart and give the Lord that center of where decision, thought, uh, emotion, anchor, everything, hearing, spiritual hearing, spiritual receptivity, will you give him your heart? So when the Lord says it is this way, you say, so am I. 
When the Lord says, do it this way, you say, that's the way I'm going to do it. When the Lord says, this is how you are to walk, and you say, that's what I'll do. I have a vision for this. I have a vision for us as a church, not, not some kind of out there vision. I'm just saying just a simple, I can see a bit farther. The Lord has been working in us for many years. We've, we've experienced, I would say, as a, as a vine. The, the husbandman is God the Father, and he prunes the vine that it may, be, it may bear fruit. God is now looking for us to have this testimony of Christ and to listen to the Holy Spirit and to have the power of the Holy Spirit in all practical ways of, of holy living and then witnessing and the gifts, and, and he wants this body to be his body and to go forth into this world and do as well. My vision is that that time is now. That we're now to turn aside from living our own individual lives or seeking our own pleasures and seek first the kingdom of God and uh, no longer approach God through lip service. Now, you might be able to fool me. I'm pretty easy to fool. I'm somewhat gullible at first, you know. 